Hello, this is Jim McKeith, and welcome to the C++ Developer Skill Sprint for January 28th, 2016. Today we're going to talk about practical data compression and decompression. The important link down there at the bottom is embt.co slash sprint dash compression. That's where you'll find more information, links, and downloads of the examples. This skill sprint is going to work across all platforms and all languages, so this applies to everybody. Um, assuming you're using 10 Seattle, uh, your mileage may vary for older versions. Parts of it are Windows specific, which I'll point those out, but most of this is across multiple platforms. So we're going to a lot we're going to cover. Some of it we'll cover in more detail with examples. Some of it I'll just point you to more information where you can figure out things and get going on your own. So a little background on compression. Now there's two types of compression, generally speaking. There's lossy compression and lossless compression. Lossless compression is used for data compression because you don't want to give up any data. Lossy compression is used for media like pictures and audio and video. And there it gives up a little bit of the data because it's the idea is that data that you wouldn't notice or that won't significantly reduce the viewing or enjoyment experience of that media. So we're talking about lossy com lossless compression today. The zip file format, which is one of the first, uh, no, it wasn't one of the first ones, one of the first most popular ones or first on Windows, or DOS actually, PKZip, uh, was developed by Philip Katz and it used different compression options, but the most popular option was deflate. And deflate was based on Limple Ziv Welch. Now Limple Ziv, they actually, if I remember correctly, they had two papers they wrote back in 1977, 1978 on compression. Most compressions are based on those original two papers, 77 and 78. So you'll see a lot of things that'll be LZ something, and that'll be the compression. It'll be based on, basically took their, their original papers, built on that, and came up with a new compression format. So LZW is the basis for the Unix compress and for the compression inside GIF images. Now, Later, it was found that there was patent encumbrance on that implementation. So gzip was an open alternative implementation to compress to avoid the patents, and it was optimized for speed. Now, the idea was it could open and or compress and decompress the same data, but it was a, uh, a free alternative. Later on, the zlib library was developed as a wrapper around both deflate and gzip. So the difference was gzip has some headers on it, whereas deflate is just raw compressed data. Zlib also supports uh, PNG images, which take advantage of the deflate compression used in zlib. Okay, so that's kind of a brief overview of compression formats. Uh, if you want more information, uh, Mark Adler wrote a great Stack Overflow post about this, or you can check out the Wikipedia entry for data compression. So there's a few other alternatives besides the main of uh, zip and de uh, deflate. Uh, RAR uses Limple Ziv Store Zamansky. LZSS actually uses some of its own compression formats as well. Uh, 7-Zip, which is the newest and most, one of the more popular ones right now. Uh, RAR has been around for quite a while, but 7-Zip is uh, very, very popular. It's free. Uh, uses the Limple Ziv Markov chains, LZMA. It, um, one note is both 7-Zip and RAR support all the other common file formats as well. 7-Zip will, for example, support RAR. Uh, CAB, which is Microsoft's preferred one, or at least it was, I'm not sure if it still is or not, uses Deflate LZ77, which is the Limple Ziv 1977 paper with Huffman encoding. And then TAR. Now, TAR is not actually in a compressed file format. It's a tape archive. And what it does is it joins a bunch of files together so that they can then be compressed. So one note about archive files is if you take the original zip file, what it did is it compressed each file with the uh, preferred compression format, which I said was usually deflate. And then it puts those all together into one big archive with a header that says, this is the files I contain. This is where they're at. This is how big they were, et cetera. All this metadata about it. So when you open a zip file in a zip viewer, it will give you a little window that shows you, you know, checksums and all these different values about these files. So that's an archive file that takes advantage of compression 
within the archive file. Now, with when archive files, you can talk about archive files. For example, you have the tar file, which is a bunch of files that have been joined together, which can then be compressed. So sometimes on like Linux or Unix, you'll see tar.gz, which would be a tar file, which is a bundle of files that has then been compressed with gzip. A tar is an example of a solid archive, which is where you combine multiple files together and then compress them, which is a, different than a, a regular archive, like the traditional zip file, where you compress each of the files individually and then combine them together. Now, the difference is that the solid archives take more memory or take more time because it builds a much larger compression dictionary, and that gives it the ability to actually compress it better. For more information on uh, archive format, you can check out that Wikipedia link there. So HTTP compression, it, it, they call it encoding. You can specify in your request, you say accept encoding, and then in the response, it'll say content encoding, and that'll tell you what it was encoded as. So the idea is that you say to the server, I will accept these types of encoding, and the server says, this is the type of encoding you get. Usually it respects that. It doesn't have to though. Sometimes you might say, I will accept gzip and deflate. And it will say, I got nothing for you. Or other times you'll say, give it to me in plain text by specifying an empty accept encoding. And for example, in Stack Overflow's case, it always gives you gzip back. So the two most common are gzip and deflate, which in accept encoding, you say accept encoding gzip comma deflate, and it would give you one of those two, whichever the server preferred, which will usually be gzip. There's a number of other encodings that are also possible. Um, I will point out the one at the end there, uh, Brotilli, which is a name of a Swedish pastry, I believe, is actually a new compression format that was developed, I think, by Google. It's been implemented in um, Firefox, and Google's planning to implement it in Chromium and Chrome. And it's a new compression format that is specifically built around HTTP uh, compression. What it does differently is they've analyzed a bunch of HTML and looked at it and found common things. So if you think about HTML, it has tags and they said, oh, all these tags are common. So they've taken it, built up this dictionary of all these common tags. And what they do is they pre-initialize the compression algorithm with this dictionary of tags so that it can achieve better compression when it's compressing HTML. Otherwise, it's based on the same compression uh, deflate. Well, it's a little ziv variant. I don't know exactly what implementation it is. And so it's it's just as fast. And for non-HTML, it compresses it just the same. But when it comes to HTML and a few other types, data types, it's uh, over 20% or about 20% more effective, better compression. So that's pretty cool. So we might see more of that in the future, the Brotilli. Uh, compression format or encoding format. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. So your compression library options, we're going to talk about uh, pre-installed. You have system.zlib and system.zip, as well as Indy's TID compressor zlib. System.zlib is low level, allows you to uh, compress and decompress streams of data or strings or whatever, any sort of bits of data you want to compress. Now, if you want to actually put bits of data into a zip file that can be opened by other file formats. That's when you want to use system.zip as a tzip file in there. Now you could take a tz, use the system.zlib, compress a stream of data and save it to a file, but it wouldn't be a zip file. It wouldn't have that metadata in there that describes the zip file. That's what system.zip does with the tzip file. So with that, you're able to create zip files, add files to it, remove files, and otherwise manage zip files. The Indies TID compressor zlib is has some compression um, methods specifically focused for data transfer, for like HTTP compression, FTP compression, etc. And then via Git it we have a couple options. You have Abrevia, which is available for all platforms. It supports uh, a wide variety of compressions beyond just the zlib, gzip, deflate, etc., and has some great test suites so you can see the examples of how it's used. Then Jedi JCL has the JCL compression library. It's Windows only, and it actually adds the ability to work with 7-zip files. So that's worth checking out as well if you want to deal with 7-zip files. Okay, let's take a look at 
doing some compression, real world practical data compression and decompression. So I've come up with three, what I think practical decompression compression examples here. The first one is just going to use system.zlib to compress and decompress some data. So I'll run this first. And what this does is it takes the data, compresses it, and then decompresses it, and compresses it at different compression levels. So here's the none compression level, which is just stored. It's just going to store the file. And you notice it's actually one byte bigger here. And that's because it has a little byte at the front that says uh, the information about being compressed in there. Then we have here's the default compression, which is a 0.3 ratio. So we can see here's the original, there's the compressed, there's the decompressed. And here's a hash just showing that it was decompressed successfully. That's before, that's after. Fastest, we'll see, and Mac, we'll see not much difference from the default. Little difference, but not much difference. And that's because we're really not dealing with a lot of data. So let's go ahead in here, and I'm gonna grab all the source code here to system.zip. And we'll put that in here. And we'll compress that. And we'll see that again, we're getting uh, much, much different, larger difference between default and fastest here. Uh, the max is a little bit better than default. So most of the time, probably default's good. But there you go, you can see how it works. So let's take a look at how you do this. So what we're doing here is I just have a method here called test compress that I pass in the different compression levels and it then compresses at that level. So the code here to compress, pretty straightforward. We're, I've added the, you know, I guess I can show you here, system.zlib to our include. So the we have two streams here. We have our string stream for uncompressed, this is the uncompressed data we're reading from the memo. And then we have a memory stream that's our compressed data. And then the compression is actually handled right here. We should use the Z compress stream. So we can use the T compressor, T compression I think is what it is. Let's look here. Yeah. Um, yeah, T, TZ compression stream or T compression stream. You can use that if you want to have an object to work with, but for this one, I thought it'd be easier just to have a single method call. And I just use Z compression stream, pass in the uh, uncompressed stream and the compressed stream, and then the compression level, which remember the compression level is passed into us, and it's one of those four values. And then to decompress it, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna clear that uh, stream, the uh, uncompressed string out, stream out so that we can reuse it. And we can do the same thing here. We have the sourced destination. We don't specify a compression level because it doesn't need to know the compression level for decompressing it. It just decompresses it. The compression level has to do with the effort it puts into compressing it, but that has nothing to do with decompressing because it decompresses it the same way. And then we put the text in there and then we just have a little log in here to uh, provide some information so that we can see how it works. And it does compare the hashes to make sure that they did not fail. That's it. That's all it is to working with the Zlib library to compress and decompress data. Second one here. Actually, we run this one first. This one uses the rest components. I'll show you the rest components. That's probably a good place to start. So we're using the rest components and we're connecting to the API, Stack Exchange API for Stack Overflow, and we're gonna pull some questions out based on the C++ Builder tag. Now, on the request here, you can specify the encoding you want. Now, if I leave this blank, Stack Exchange will always give me back gzip encoded data. They said, there's no reason not to, everybody can decompress this, so we're just gonna give you gzip encoded, and even if you say otherwise. Uh, actually, if you say something it doesn't recognize, or if you say, blank, then it gives you gzip, or if they you say gzip, if you ask for deflate, it'll give you deflate. But we're just gonna ask for gzip, gzip is the standard, and uh, we'll get that back. Now there's an event on here after execute. I'm gonna take this off right now. That's the 
workaround, the fix for how to deal with GZIP compressed data. So let's run this first. And we're gonna hit fetch. It says response content is not valid JSON. And you can see that clearly is not valid JSON. So the way we make this work is on a request, we just add the after execute event handler in here. And we call this decode rest response passing in the rest response that we want to decode. And now we run it. And we fetch and we see clearly we got some JSON here and look and sure enough, that's a beautiful grid full of stack overflow questions that are tagged C++ builder. Lots of great fun information to look at here. So this decode rest response actually is written in object Pascal and it is using the um, ID lib, ID Z lib compressor, all right here, ID compressor Z lib, that's the one we're looking for. And that is the indie compressor Z lib library. And it looks to see what the content encoding is and then compresses D gzip. Now I tested it with the deflate because that's the server also supports deflate. It doesn't work. And I did some research into deflate. Apparently deflate is widely broken on the internet. <laughs> there, when it was originally implemented, people implemented different ways and expecting different things. And so some servers and some browsers try and do a little uh, soft shoe dance to try and make it work. It doesn't always work. And in this case, it doesn't work. So uh, that's why gzip is recommended and that's why gzip is the most common compression format used on the web so you can download this code and just use it in your c projects and you don't need to bother bother with it but this is just an example of how you can use the indie compressor zlib to deal with compressed http data and now lastly here's this is using the zip file compression So what we're doing here is we're just going to uh, get the directory, get the files in the directory, which is going to be the up two folders from where it's ran from, which will be the source code for the project itself. And we're going to use the tzip file, which is in system.zip. And we open it and we give it a file name, which is the file name on disk of the archive, which in this case is demo.zip. And we specify the mode, which in this case we're writing to it. And now we're going to spin through all the files that we found in our directory listing, and we're going to add them to that. Now you add it, you give it two names, you give it the source file name, and then you give it the destination file name. This is what's called inside the zip file. Now you can store the full path, although you want to reverse the direction of the slashes. And so instead of backslashes, you want to store them as forward slashes. Uh, it's just the way that it stores them in the archive. And then you reverse it on the way back out. And then what we're doing here is we're looking at the zips file info for the file we just added to get the compressed size and the uncompressed size, just so we can calculate the ratio. And we'll put that in a list box just to view it here. So we'll go ahead and run this. And there we go, we see that's the compression ratios and the file names of the files we just added. You can't, there's a number of other options you can do with zip files. So this is just kind of scratching the surface but you can see it's pretty easy to work with the tzip file in order to create and add files to a zip file archive on disk. If you would like more information, you can find examples of using the system.zlibs tcompress and tdecompress there. There's both Delphi and C++ Builder examples. Then if you wanna take advantage of the system.zip.tzip file, there's the documentation on it for you available there. Abrevia, here's a link to where you can view the uh, tests, the unit tests online. Abrevia is installed via Git it, and when it's installed, it's put in that code repository folder that you see there. Uh, the code repository is in your user directory, and then whatever that code repository folder is, the abrevia 10.0 slash tests is where you can find those tests to see how those, all the functionality and how they work. Uh, those tests were developed by Robert Love, one of our fabulous MVPs. Thank you, Robert, for that. And then the JCL compression library, which is installed also installed via Git as part of the Jedi JCL. You can browse that on GitHub, or you can also find JCL compression .pass in your BDS code in your catalog repository as well. Once you've installed it via Git, links 
All these links and more are available at embt.co slash sprint dash compression. Give me a brief moment to tell you about this limited time special offer. All 10 Seattle registered users get the bonus pack, which includes the new Object Pascal Handbook by Marco Cantu. This essential language reference is a modern language guide that includes new features of the language and the core runtime library, a must-have for any Delphi developer. Also get the Binder Converter Basic. It handles the heavy lifting when converting existing VCL applications into FireMonkey applications so you can start taking advantage of multi-device development right away. And the Premium Style Pack includes premium styles for VCL and FireMonkey to make your application look great on every platform. For more information on these special offers or to find out what the current offers are, please visit www.embarcadero.com slash rad offer. Next time is developing REST servers from scratch with Craig Chapman. He's one of our SCs. Uh, Tuesday will be Delphi, which is the 2nd of February, and C++ Builder is on Thursday, the 4th of February. All those dates and times are based on San Francisco time, so check timeanddate.com or whatever mechanism you use to check time zones and make sure those are correct. If you want to see the full schedule or replays, check out the link you see there in the middle. And that's it. Now it's time for Q&A. There is a question here. Does the system.zip support uh, password encrypted zip files? You know, I looked all the way through, Jim, the source code, and I couldn't see any reference to password parameters or event handlers or intercept. Yeah on the system.zip versus the zlib. Yep, I was just looking at that just right now, and I don't see it either. I know the Abrevia does support password uh, encrypted zip files. If you take a look at those unit tests, it has unit tests specifically around testing to uh, testing the passwords as well. So if you want password encrypted zip files, you can check out Abrevia. Uh, the JCL one may or may not. I don't know for sure. Take a look at that one and see. And there's some other libraries out there as well that may support it. I know there's other zip files out there, but I want to stick to the ones that were in the box, as it were, uh, which includes the ones available via Git it because they're so easy to install. Yeah, I searched all over. I couldn't find anything about zip. I guess the way to test it is to take the app sample and try extracting a file from a password-protected zip. Maybe yep. there's something under the covers. I didn't look in the source code to see if it would, I wouldn't imagine, though, pop up something, but how would it know that it isn't a console app or something else with no interface? So you can go to the doc wiki yourself or go into the source code and take a look on system.zip. Yep, exactly. That's what I did. Trying to think, so the I know that one of the ways I tested the system about zip sample I made is the zip file I created. And actually, I'm going to show this in the video is I opened it up in 7-zip and it said showed all the files just fine. I was able to extract them. Okay. Uh, so I know that that works that way, but I did not test uh, password encrypting it and trying opening it up from there. Uh, Jim has provided link to the the demos for both C++ and Delphi on his GitHub. Come here that I'm using the the Bob Jenkins hash. Uh, it says that it's different between Win32 Android and iOS. I have hadn't seen that it's different. The Bob Jenkins hash specifically is different on those other platforms. I choose Bob Jenkins because um, I didn't need a cryptographically secure hash, and it was in this case on the same platform, so that wasn't an issue. But uh, I just wanted something short and simple hash, so that's why I used Bob Jenkins. I've not uh, looked at the differences on other platforms though. The question here, what is the best technique for compressing data for REST servers manually to use interceptors or ID zip compressor? Um, we'd want to use the gzip compression and you wouldn't, let's, so this depends on what you're using to post it to the REST server. If you're using the ND components, then you could use the uh, uh, ID zip compressor. If you're using 
That's a good question. I haven't tried that. So it depends. It depends on what mechanism you're using to send it to the rest of, to the server. So if you're using like um, data snap, then yeah, use an interceptor. And you're using both sides there, so it doesn't matter what library you use as far as the compression goes. So you can choose the uh, system.zlib and compress it with gzip or whatever you want to use really at that point. The one thing I didn't test was, or didn't experiment with, was the uh, compressing data being sent to the server. <laughs> so, But uh, it, it, you did see how to use the system.zlib library to do compression and decompression, and you can just use that exact same uh, mechanism to compress the data with uh, with uh, data snap there to send it to the server. But yeah. so last week we saw the um, compressing data with uh, uh, app tethering, not compressing data, encrypting data with app tethering. You could use the system.zlib with app tethering using that same mechanism. And if you wanted to compress and encrypt it, you'd compress it first and then encrypt it. And the reason is, is because uh, repetition is weakens encryption, but uh, and uh, encrypt compression removes repetition. So if you compress it first and then encrypt it, then you'll have even stronger encryption. And plus, once you encrypt it, you can't compress it very well because then it becomes kind of randomized. So yeah, you can use it with app tethering or any place else you would. Um, any place else you can intercept the data, you know, stream data or whatever, you can just compress it right there. Yes. When you were doing the, wasn't that a REST call or maybe that was just an HTTP S call to the Stack Overflow API? Yeah, so that was a REST call and it was decompressing it via okay. REST there. But I wasn't sending it to, I wasn't compressing it to send it over REST. I didn't try that. So I was just using the REST client at that point instead of, using data snap to send data via REST. Got it. And next week, it ties into next week as well. I'm not sure if Craig's going to cover it, but he's building a REST server from scratch, both in Delphi and in C++. And again, he could encrypt the JSON or whatever and pass it along. Right? Yep, so he's building a, um, we've got to build a standalone REST server, and then he's also building an ASAPI module. And so with the ASAPI module, once you've plugged it into the ASAPI server, then the IIS can, or IIS can then uh, turn on encryption and compression for you automatically. And so that gets handled automatically on the server side by the web server, IIS web server, because you're, if you're ASAPI module, you just plug it into the IIS server. But then on the client side, you would inf um, implement the REST or the decompression just like I showed you in this example here. So if you had it on a IIS server that was compressing it, you would use the decompression like I showed you in the example here, and it would decompress that data for you. And then because the REST, or, uh, the REST client is using the system.net sockets, it automatically handles the SSL compression or encryption for you. So that's cool. Any software similar to IIS that can do the same thing, but with more features. Apache, similar to IIS. I mean, there's lots of other web servers out there. Generally, Apache and IIS are the two big ones. Um, you could build your own web server from scratch, too. There's lots of options. Yeah, Marco did a skill sprint last year about how to use Apache modules, I think with EMS. I don't think it was DataSnap, but it doesn't really matter. It's Apache. Right. And once we have Linux server support that's on our roadmap to the future, uh, then Apache would come into play again for data snap servers, EMS servers, web servers, and so on, running on Intel Linux servers. So, um, but that's not here today. Today, EMS, data snap, Indie, all sorts of different solutions for building client and server side things. And if you need encryption, if it's HTTPS, then you've encrypted there. Interbase, I mentioned XZ7, it encrypts a database at the database level and the column level, and it also does over the wire encryption when you're doing client server, whether it's FireDAC or, or whatever, talking to Interbase. So there's lots of ways to think about security and securing data, both 
data at rest when it's sitting in a database, when it's in motion across the wire or through app tethering or data snap, EMS, web servers, and so on. So you can encrypt in all sorts of ways. The only thing we don't do specifically is encryption uh, of your RAM memory in your computer. People use there to do those kinds of things. Although you could encrypt a memory stream and leave it in memory, right, Jim? Right. Yeah, you could encrypt a memory stream and then just um, only decrypt it as you're reading it, and then make sure you write over it when you're done with it. Uh, also, if you are concerned about your encryption as far as your data and memory, if you take advantage of the systems encryption libraries, and I did a code rage session years ago on unlocking the Windows Crypto API and using that, and the advantage of that is that Windows understands that when you're using the Crypto API that it should be encrypted in memory, that things shouldn't be uh, cached to disk if, if the uh, uh, swap file from the swap file and stuff like that, and so it is able to handle all that stuff in memory differently, and because it, it knows it is encrypted as opposed to just regular data, and so there's an advantage of using that. So you could totally use that as well as a way to uh, uh, beef up your encryption and security. Okay, Jim, thanks very much. This is great, and everyone, up. Oh, let's see, skill sprint success suggestion. Ah, streams, readers, writers. Okay, streaming streams. We did a. Uh, it seems like, oh, that's right, the Android session. So a couple weeks ago, we had a session on Android save state, and that uses a stream and a reader and a writer on that stream. So yeah. if you combine what you saw today where I was creating streams um, to pull, like, for example, the strings in and out and the memory streams, and that's all there is to using streams, and then if you go with the what we showed two weeks ago with the Android... Uh, Save state, it was two weeks, three weeks, something like that, and that shows how to use the the readers and writers to read and write from that stream. It's really pretty simple. Just take a look at those two things there, and you'll see the parts. And then beyond that, you can uh, put you put it all together and do whatever you want to do with those. So, very powerful stuff there. The the readers and writers in the streams. Yeah, and then some other best practices. I mean, memory streams uh, versus string st streams. If you're assigning one st a string stream. Um, then it's going to move the bytes. If you have a memory stream, you can just have a reference to it, right? There's just some different best practices that you can do as far as optimizing performance, but uh, you can right, yeah. If you don't, if you don't need to copy it between streams, yeah, you can just pass a reference to the stream, and that will not replicate. Yeah, I do that in my XML parsing and XML document, where I'm just parsing, I'm not copying the data. So I use memory streams. Yep. Okay, Jim. Thanks a bunch. Thanks, everyone. Every Thursday, C. Tell your friends. See you next week. Bye, everyone. Bye.